Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, you're in for a treat. This is our four year anniversary and we're so excited for you to be with us and for us to answer your questions on media and digital productions of all kinds. Now, our second hour is something we typically want to spend a little bit more time on. And of course, since it's our anniversary, we'll be speaking with some of the OGs that are with us on the panel. Of course, producers submit your questions for the first and second hour. And if you are watching the replay, go ahead and head over to askofficehours.global. It's open 24-7 for us to answer your questions. And speaking of questions, let's get into it. Our first one this morning, Liberty, is from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. And Guy says, how are you using MITI, M-I-T-T-I, in production? All right. Who do we have first? It's a window wanted to move. All right, George, go ahead. So we, for every show I've been on in the past couple of months, MIDI is the go-to for 69 play out. So it's being adopted across the board. And David? I'm actually using MIDI in kind of non-traditional ways. Yes, it'll do audio, video, still playback. I'll also use it to take the uh, play out window of um, Keynote capture that as a windowed device. So now you have direct and the uh, direct screen scrape into MIDI to play back out. It'll do multi output so you can send it to HDMI out, uh, deck link, NDI all at the same time up to three and do all sorts of manipulation. It's a, it's the Swiss army knife of video and cue playback from in my opinion. And Jason. Anytime I need to do play out with uh, an alpha channel and it can't fail, playlists, things like that, um, MIDI is and has been for years my, my only way of doing that. Next question. Robert Soji is up next from Los Angeles, California. Is there an adapter to convert Apple's Thunderbolt display into an HDMI display? Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, no, because the uh, Thunderbolt display does require specifically a Thunderbolt connection uh, because it has uh, um, other connectors at the back that, that require data um, connectivity, uh, not just a display out, but like a, like a, dis a display port or HDMI. Um, it does specifically need Thunderbolt. If you're talking about the older um, LED cinema displays, uh, those um, there are... Um, HDMI to active HDMI to display port adapters that work with those, but not with a Thunderbolt display. And Jason? Yeah, not with any Thunderbolt display that's that's been released for the last, I don't know, but five, six, seven years. And the reason is that um, it needs to interleave the two display port lanes that are part of Thunderbolt. So um, yeah, no. Next question. Paul Wallace is up next from Austin, Texas, and Paul says, you've cut the cord. So, cord cutter, what do you do with the network cable TV coax cables and RJ11 landline phone cables that run all through your walls? Can you think of an alternative use? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I built a pretty good-sized house, lots of rooms, lots of kitchens, and I put Ethernet cable and phone cable all through the walls, so... Some of the uses I've thought of is Ethernet conversion, which I don't really need because I already have Ethernet. Maybe run security cameras to some areas. And also uh, maybe for sound, you know, maybe you could run speakers or subwoofers and uh, VoIP. I've, maybe someday I'll do VoIP to replace the old phone system I don't have anymore, the old, old school phone system. David? It, well, when you're ready to do all those conversions, use the existing cables to pull new stuff through those exact openings, and you'll be good to go. Good call, Jeffrey. Absolutely. As long as they're not tied down, it's a lot. Of, it's pretty easy to do. Another thing that you could do is, uh, first of all, you want to go throughout the house and you want to take out all the uh, adapters and uh, and because if it's running, going down uh, and then coming back up, it's going to be kind of pointless if it's going uh, to a place that's not being used. Uh, there are Ethernet to Ethernet point adapters that work okay, but are not, I don't highly recommend. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's uh, devices like, uh, I just got a Tableau, which is a, a home in or a home TV, which you can then use these cables as Ethernet or as antennas for that, for setting that up. And then you can use apps uh, to watch your TV if you need it. And Courtney. 
Yeah, Jeffrey just stole my answer. Yeah, Tableau TV. And if you can, get the older one, not the new white one. The old black one is better because it has a remote app so that you can watch, uh, connect to your Tableau TV and has a DVR. So you can play back stuff off your Tableau DVR from anywhere in the world, off any device that can connect to it. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. And Douglas says, I've been trying out Poe, a multi-large language model app, and I found that the Claude 3 Opus model with 200K context window is the best I've seen for written tasks. Is there any multi-large language model app where I can pay a fixed fee per month for unlimited access? Paul? Anything, anything LLM. Next question. Next question comes to us from Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam, B.C. And here on the panel, what is the playout solution when you need to play back some audio while another video is already playing? I haven't tested playout B, but I have a countdown timer and I need the intro to play right before it hits zero. Do I need two playback systems? David. Well, if it's strictly audio and you're looking to bury it under video, I'll use Farago by uh, Rogue Amoeba. Um, it's a good single trigger kind of thing. It's OSC driven, so you can use it in conjunction with something like MIDI, Farago, and that clock that's over there behind my shoulder, clock 8001. We'll do all that timer stuff and trigger-based uh, workflows like that. Alex. Of course, I build my countdown clocks. Um, I typically build countdown clocks or, or clocks um, uh, on my own inside of something like Motion. And the reason is I like to have them designed. I want them to feel like they're part of the show. And so I will tend to build them um, to scratch. I, I, I have a couple fonts that I like. A lot of times the countdowns are already built in. They're just rendered out and I throw them as an alpha channel. In Mimo Live, I'll just throw them over top of a background plate. Um, but, uh, but I can also throw those. Once you've rendered out a bunch of different solutions and we have someone with a keyboard opened um if someone's typing with a keyboard um the uh uh so you can if you render out a bunch of different fonts with those you can even add them in keynote so you can build the keynote file the way you want throw the throw the countdown clock in and hit render and you'll have what you need so some it might it's a i find it to be a little bit nicer to look at um, when you when you think about I mean how you put those together, but usually it's part of the whole slide design. Uh, I use Farago as well as well as David for um, any kind of audio playout. And I think we might have lost. Look, did we lose? We uh, we did. Yeah, go ahead, so, Mickey. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, um, uh, I would default to good old the reliable Q Lab for this. Um, you can have as many uh, cues playing as you want, and you can trigger the uh, secondary or the, all the other cues, um, either through manually hitting go on that cue or timing it to a specific point in the already playing cue. Um, it's very flexible in how you um, you want to trigger the succeeding cues to um, to go. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and if you're using uh, Rodecaster Pro or any of the many uh, digital audio mixers that are out there, most of them have mix pads uh, on them that you can add uh, tracks to that you're going to use regularly. And you can just uh, trigger them at will off a button. Let's go to the next question. Next one comes to us from George Kennedy Jr. in Washington, D.C., also here on the panel. What's your workflow for offloading records on AV shows and productions? What drives are you using? Uh, go ahead, Hasmuk. Yes, my everything I've learned about production is from this community in office hours. So my very first production, I recorded everything between my ears and my friends here uh, convinced me to write everything down and record it. So I've evolved the workflow. The entire program is managed scheduling in monday.com, but I create a folder on my hosting machine and every asset is recorded from the settings in uh, ATEM, the settings in companion, uh, mix effects and so on and so on. And everything is then, once it's all, when the project is complete, then I transfer all of that into a lazy external hard drive and the project is dated and ev every asset, believe me, every asset is in there. Jason? Uh, first thing I do when it's off the camera is I, I put it onto a, an OWC jump drive, which is actually really, really fast. You can actually record these uh, directly um, to an iPhone at 4K 60. These are fast enough to keep up with it. 
I load everything onto there. And then from there, it's to frame IO and to my NAS, which in turn also syncs with its own cloud backup. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, uh, typically the DIT or DITs or data wranglers would um, uh, initially get the the media, the original recording media, and uh, ingest that into their RAID on their DIT carts. Um, and then once it's ingested there, it would be then be duplicated to multiple production drives. So um, uh, media does not leave set with at least three copies of them existing. A uh, copy sticks with the DIT, they take care of that. Um, a copy is sent over to the um, to the post house uh, where when it reaches the post house, it goes into the post house own storage system, which uh, usually includes a bunch of redundancies as well. And another copy goes to um, the productions for them to, to keep. Um, typically, these are uh, RAID arrays that are used uh, because, um, say, on a uh, on a large TV show, um, one like one or a documentary with a lot of footage, you're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40 terabytes per day of material. So these are typically RAID arrays. More common now is um, uh, RAID arrays that are built out of spinning drives, um, just because of the uh, of the costs. But we're seeing more and more productions use uh, solid state based uh, RAID arrays. Again, like it depends on uh, the production, how much material they need to do. But these are, again, usually raids. David. Yeah, at the at the office, we have a crazy workflow of ingest through Telestream Vantage, normalize things, puts it up to Sony C, which is very similar to Frame.io. Um, and the bucket there is kind of endless in size. For local storage, we always had... Uh, racks full of uh, Netgear, no, no, NetApp drives uh, that were just spinning. But since we all left for home, those things have been kind of scrapped. And Paul? Uh, with a lot of help from Mickey and from Matthew in After Hours, I've, I've set up a Synology 1522 Plus. It's awesome. It comes in a uh, 40 terabyte bundle. I've got one here. And in Hot Springs, they're synchronized. And it's awesome for saving large video files. Next question. Francis Frey in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts is up next. I'd like to record two Sony ZV-E1 cameras in 4K synced with one another. I'm looking for the simplest solution possible, Blackmagic ecosystem preferred. Go ahead, Mickey. Hey, unfortunately, the Sony ZV-E1 does not have... Uh, a sync input, a gen lock input. So there's no way to actually sync the cameras, meaning like singing the, syncing the actual sensors uh, together in time. Um, but in case you, what you're talking about is simply um, uh, striping a time code onto the cameras, you can feed, you can use a, um, a time code generator to feed time code into the audio tracks of each camera. Um, you would need a time code a generator uh, for each camera. Uh, I have a couple here. This ones are the um, the UltraSync ones from uh, Time Code Systems. Now I think they've been purchased by uh, Atomos. Uh, this is from Time Code Systems. Another one that I like using is the um, is the uh, Nano Lockets from Ambient, and I I store them in in this pouch with a uh, a bunch of uh, what do you call this um, industrial strength Velcro to Velcro them onto the cameras. Um, and you would need a box per camera to feed timecode into the audio track. Now, when of course, when you play back the audio, you will hear the timecode signal in there. You would then need to uh, decode that audio timecode into metadata. And uh, NLEs uh, like um, uh, Media Composer or Resolve can decode this. Uh, uh, some, there are some applications since, such as uh, Tentacle Syncs, uh, Tentacle Studio, um, that can decode this audio timecode and turn it into metadata so you can sync the multiple cameras and the audio recorders together. And Courtney? Uh, some of what uh, Mickey said, the simplest way and the cheapest way is to use the old-fashioned way is just get you one of these uh, clapper boards <clears throat> and clap the sticks together and where both cameras see it at the same time and put the scene and take number on there. Of course, you're not going to automatically sync them up in Resolve in the Blackmagic ecosystem. If you want to do that, you're going to have to <clears throat> have a time code reference somewhere on the recording. And as Mickey said, uh, the way to do that is through something like Tentacle Sync. Tentacle Sync is a little sync box that generates empty time code on one channel, and it has a 
cable out, you plug it into the microphone input on the ZV-1s. Uh, and it also has a little built-in microphone on this on the timecode generator. So it puts a reference audio on one channel and LTC timecode on the second audio channel. Then you can bring those in to resolve and sync them to the uh, uh, sync them to the audio track. And then the, you can use the reference audio to sync them up as well. Just uh, if you're recording separately on a separate recorder that has time, so you could use the timecode to automatically sync them or you could use the reference track to audibly sync them between each other uh, on the timeline. Next question. Robert Soji in Los Angeles is up next. Does anyone make a MagSafe 2 to MagSafe 3 adap adapter? David? Not that I'm aware of. I would love it if they did because I have a bunch of the twos. The thing is MagSafe 1 to MagSafe 2 was a pin-to-pin -pin adapter. MagSafe 3, from what I was reading, is based on USB-C power delivery spec, so the pinout is completely different and, you know, might be just a matter of time before somebody hears us, hears the request and does something. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I agree with uh, David. I can't find anything on the Apple forums. The best ones I've found are made by an outfit called ESR out of Taiwan. They make some great uh, MagSafe adapters, all different kinds. Next question. David Brady in New York City here on the panel says, field time code device Tentacle Sync, which was just mentioned, tentaclesync.com, works with Blackmagic Design camera app. Would this be useful for Alex's rig? And he's got a link there to a new shooter.com article. Jason. Um, I mean, I'll let Alex answer that, but I, I don't think so because I think that rig was built for um, with electric, electrosonic uh, inputs, and it's it's designed to be its own camera. I don't think we're going to be syncing that with anything, but I could be wrong. Courtney, uh, yeah, in the case of the NAB setup, uh, we're live streaming, so we don't really have to post production sync any, anything. I did look at the uh, the way that Tentacle is handling the time code sync uh, with the Blackmagic devices. You have to. You have a lot of hoops to jump through it because it connects over Bluetooth uh, to the phone, and then you got to set it uh, to uh, time of day run, and then it will then uh, revert. Once you hit record, it'll revert to the time of day, and the rest of the time it, it shows kind of a bogus time code on the display, so you got to be careful about that. It doesn't show running time code when you're stopped. So uh, that was just a few of the gotchas in there, but uh, you can do it with the tentacle if we needed to sync up multiple cameras in post-production. Mickey. Yeah, just to add on to what the Courtney said, uh, as Courtney mentioned, it uses uh, Bluetooth connectivity between the tentacle boxes and the, and the, and the phone. So that would uh, definitely not uh, rely on that as a production grade solution. Um, if a time code is indeed required for recording, um, I would stick a, um, a traditional, uh, Sync uh, time code generator uh, like this one, um, or or even the tentacle itself, and use its uh, physical connective connection. Um, this one uses uh, little DIN connectors, while the tentacle uses mini jack connectors, and feed that stripe one of the audio channels in the video recording, and do the sync that way instead of relying on Bluetooth. And Alex. I think I'm going to actually probably give it a shot. I don't know if it'll work as well as we'd like it to, but I, I'm going to probably give it a shot because uh, almost everything that the camera can do is full. So, so I filled it up and I am, while the, 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 the iPhone camera is not really designed as live, um, the, the, I, would, I will definitely use Tentacle Sync for the, or I plan to, for the FX6 systems that we're going to use. Um, so, so we'll be, uh, we'll want to sync those up. It, we are going to be doing some records and the, and the iPhone version is really designed for records because I'm trying to record ambisonic as well as the, the mics, as well as everything else as I go through it. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm building kind of a really beast of a rig that will probably be totally absurd. Um, that will show, um, I mean, completely absurd. Uh, it's, it, I, I don't even know if I can, <laughs> I don't know if I'm willing to walk around with it. It's so big now. Um, so, so anyway, all wrapped around a little iPhone, but I'm running out of, inputs and outputs but i have uh so uh so i think that i'm going to probably try bluetooth only because i don't think there's anywhere else to put it at this point um but uh into the black magic uh, system but i think that uh I, I i do agree that the stability could be an issue but i think it'll be worth it just to try so we'll see what happens next question 
Craig Kadoki in Toronto is up next. Is anyone using Milumin, M-I-L-L-U-M-I-N, Milumin, for video playout? And what types of shows are you using it for? And he's got a link to it. Sky? Yes. Recently used it at a corporate event that had multiple projection screens as well as uh, video playback screens that all had different video sources happening simultaneously and in sync. So consequently, it was uh, very handily used that way. The two upsides of that is it is rentable, and you can also download a version of it so you can play with it to figure out how you want to use it because it really is a Swiss Army knife of abilities in playback in different locations all simultaneously. And then the flexibility of the timeline is, oh, we need to move that segment over or down or into a different location of, of the run of a show. Click, click, and it's all right there in a timeline. George. So, uh, yes, um, Malumin is used, I would say, right now in 30% of widescreen productions. As Sky mentioned, it's a multiple output uh, software, and it plays across multiple screens. So in designing, designers are using it to design an entire show. A lot of times now, if I'm switching to E2, which is barcode switcher, I'm just... Given power to the Malumin and they're driving the entire show and I'm just cutting in between maybe cameras or so. Um, the good news about Malumin, um, a lot of playout servers, you might have watch out or Resloom, but with the Malumin, you could use two Mac uh, studios, which right now a lot of folks are using the M3s and that allows you to do at least four outputs. So those four outputs will be individual outputs directly to the, um, to your switcher. And it's it's got to be a E2 or Spider, so that's what Malumin is used for. And like Sky said, corporate. I know corporate because that's most of what I work on, but I'm sure they're using it in concert venues also. But definitely a good piece of software to um, like MIDI. For I know we talked about MIDI already, but MIDI and Malumin is used together. MIDI uses um all 69 playouts, and then Malumin is used for all the widescreen playouts, including any 69 outboards. So the designer might have designed for the widescreen in the middle, and then he'll also design for the outboards. So that piece of software is playing out to all those screens. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada. I want to shoot a music video in the desert. Should I use my iPhone 14 Pro or the Brio Cam from a year ago? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, I, yes, I would use it, and I would get a uh, Insta360 Flow, not a not a link, but a Flow. That's a it's a uh, stabilizer. The iPhone fits on it perfectly. Alex. Yeah, the 14 would be definitely better than a Brio. I don't know how you would shoot it with a Brio because it'd be connected to something. I think it'd be a lot more portable to do the 14. I would, if you can get a 15, the 15 is a dramatic jump from the 14 from a visual quality and the ability of what you can do with it, recording to external drives and et cetera. So I, I think that I think about that as well. And Bill. Having spent most of my shooting career in Phoenix, Scottsdale, and environs, I will also say buy some black umbrellas. Heat is your enemy. Even with an iPhone, it can get into an overheat situation if you're shooting in the desert. So take some cover for the sun direct on whatever your rigs you're shooting with. Next question. Joe Andrews in Lebanon, Oregon is up next. Does the panel have any recommendations for a reliable HDMI dongle or dock for field presentations with customers? Currently on an M2 MacBook Air, so upgrading to a built-in port on a Pro may be a few years away. Mickey? Yeah, um, I, I would say that like if it's just like a small presentation in a little, in a little meeting, a little boardroom, uh, you, you'd be good with the um, standard... Uh, USB-C to HDMI adapter from Apple. But if you are looking to, like, if this feed will be sent out to a full-on production rig, um, I would probably move over to something like um, the uh, the Ultra Studio uh, mini monitor to output a proper um, uh, HDMI signal. And there's also an SDI out. David? I didn't think of the Ultra Studio. Um, I, I actually have one of those Sonnet boxes for SDI playout, if that's applicable. Otherwise, like Mickey said, just a standard dongle to HDMI, depending on what the target is. And Jason. I really like this one from OWC. This is a Thunderbolt mini dock. It gives you two 4K outs, two USB, uh, one USB 3, one USB 2, and then... Um, and then full Ethernet, and it's just all from one Thunderbolt port, and it's 
it doesn't require any pass through power, which is just awesome. Go ahead, David. Yeah, the only problem, though, Jason, is the M2 will only do the one display. So that's kind of overkill. So if you're just going to one HDMI, you know, just saying, not arguing, just saying. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes to us from Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. And Bobby notes, NVIDIA is now cloud streaming OpenUSD to Apple Vision OS with the Apple Vision Pro product. And he's got a link there. Alex. Yeah, so what it looks like, I, 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 I hadn't seen it until I saw this uh, question pop up. So it's, it's um, the, uh, I, it looks like you're able to actually build, use AI to generate 3D models, and it's basically sending those to the, to the and I think you're going to see this pretty quickly with the Apple Vision Pro, where you're able to, with NVIDIA or other, or Apple or others, be able to start using AI to ask for objects. So you put your headset on and say, I'd like to have a chair here, I'd like to have this over here and be able to just start generating those objects by asking for them and placing them into your scene. Um, that's stuff that a lot of us have thought about for about a decade. And so we think that that'll probably start uh, ramping up. I think we're still seeing only a very beginning of what Apple has planned and what other companies have planned for the Vision Pro. We should really watch carefully between now and, uh, and uh, w WWDC. <laughs> Next question. Alton Christensen in New York City. Circling back, what is MITI and what is it designed to do and what apps use it? George? So MIDI, if you ever heard of Playback Pro, MIDI is the opposite of Playback Pro. Um, it's adapted over, a lot of major companies have moved to, to MIDI. Um, a little bit more about MIDI, it will do NDI out. You could do up to three screens out. It's um, aggressively uses deck links, so you can uh, output the deck link cards. So that it allows you to do um, alpha channels out, so you could actually do lower thirds and so forth. Um, you could do NDI out, like I said, and um, that allows you to push it across um, multiple destinations. What I like about MIDI, what I do late, as of lately, if I, I don't have a lot of sources in my multi-view, I will give the show caller another version of MIDI. It's not mapped to my switcher, but it's just mapped to the multi-view, and you could do overlays to it. So the show caller can actually see the time the time play, for playback. Um, what I like to remind them not to do is not to call those playbacks. They're the person that's doing the playback call at times, but putting it in the multi-view allows them to actually see the playback. So it has overlays also. David. It'll do a bunch more too. It, it has siphon capabilities both in and out, I believe, or at least out. Um, a couple of the cool features that I like with MIDI, like I said earlier, uh, <clears throat> is it'll have a window source as, as a queue. So you can take a virtual window of a browser, or like I said, uh, the, the playout window of Keynote and bring that in as a source. So now everything is linearly done, OSC driven, so Stream Decks, et cetera, with Companion can drive the experience. Um, it also has a web presenter queue, so you can bring in a raw web page in and demo things that way. It does a lot of scaling, flipping, and all sorts of stuff. It's I love it. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Stephen Kansaunes in Chapel Hill says, I was watching the other day and the panel warned against the Samsung T7 for recording video. I'd like to get started recording video from my iPhone 15 Pro to an SSD. Does the panel have any recommendations for SSD options? Alex. A lot of us have T5s, which we've used pretty successfully. It's the T7 has a different set of caching on it. The T5 has a lot of mounting options, and because there's because it was very popular, uh, the T7 had some caching issues. I actually don't think you'll have a problem recording from a 15 Pro to a T7. It's a much lower amount of bandwidth than what we were having trouble with, which was Blackmagic RAW. So when we were recording very, very high res, now you may have trouble with Apple ProRes 444, uh, it may be more than the Samsung can do over a long period of time. This isn't something that happens for the first little bit of time that you're recording. It's something if you're trying to add a, lar a longer clip is where we saw issues, and a lot of us did. So, so that's the thing to kind of take into consideration. But the T5 works also. Uh, a lot of us build our own. Um, uh, so a lot of us build our own uh, MVME uh, drives. You can buy the cases and the MVME memory and uh, actually just build it yourself. It takes a little bit of care. There's some heat sink issues that you need to make sure that you're taking care of, but they're not hard to build. Alexander? Yeah, I assemble my own NVMe drives, and uh, previously I, I was using the the small rig NVMe drives, but I found that the uh, the heat sink itself uh, wasn't that great, and I had one that uh, caused caused some problems. So I'm using these Vantech NVMe enclosures. They have a a better external heat sink, so they seem to transfer the heat away from the NVMe drives. I put the Western Digital Black. 
uh, NVMe drives in there. I've had really good success with them, and they're inexpensive. The other thing that I do is I always put a, a, a label here that says the name of the drive that's in there, and then I put the, the date so that I know when I actually first put this into service. And Hasmuk? Yeah, like Alex, I've used the T5 only on my Blackmagic cameras. To do the ISO recording on the ATEM, I've used the CalDigit SSDs, uh, the one terabyte and two terabytes. I haven't had problems with the ISO recording. What I did find is I used the T7 as an external SSD for managing my photos and it gets extremely hot. So the heat dissipation is not that good on a T7. So I haven't dared use the T7 on my Blackmagic production. And just bringing in some of our producers into the conversation, Stephen, Stephen says, thank you. That was very helpful. Happy fourth anniversary. And then Henry says, wow, good to see OGs today. Next question. Next one comes from TJ Asher, speaking of OGs, uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And TJ says, I have a bunch of family video in probably a dozen different formats, frame rates, and sizes. Some are 200 by 200 pixels from an old camera. What's the best way to conform the old video to newer 1080p? I understand the old video will look bad versus the newer stuff. Go ahead, Alex. Um, I, I think that Topaz Video AI is probably the best uh, upscaler that I have seen. Um, upscaler, retimer, all those things, both with video and there's another one called Photo AI. This is not an inexpensive solution. It's, I think two or three hundred dollars to get it. Um, I don't remember what the video one is. I know that I just bought the photo one, <laughs> so it's, it's. I know it's two hundred dollars, um, uh, but it is. Uh, the results are amazing. Like it, it's really, especially if you give it the time. Now I've done some pretty heavy conversions, 4K from 24 to 60 and that type of thing over an hour and a half. And just to give you a sense of that, that conversion took 70 hours, you know, for it to kind of uh, process all those frames. But what I got was a 60 frame per second video that had no, I mean, like literally no, no artifacts. <laughs> so it was quite a thing to, to look at. So, um, so I would, uh, it can be slow, uh, but it is very powerful. Um, it's the most powerful thing I've seen so far that isn't, there are some industrial ones that are much more powerful, but they are super expensive um, or you rent them in the cloud. Uh, but for a table, you know, desktop home use, I think Topaz is probably the best bet. Jason? Yeah, plus one on Topaz. It is really impressive. And I believe the video version of it is 300, last I checked. Next question. Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia. Why are the pro-level clapperboards with timecode display so expensive? Are they really that complicated or costly to manufacture? Or did they just charge over $1,000 because the industry can stomach it? Mickey? Yeah, I, I'd say that like with with regards to smart slates, I'm, two things come to mind for me. Um, for, first off, like the how large of a market is there? They're doing like a they're they're spending a lot of um of money on R and D on these devices while the market they're s selling a couple uh, I don't know a couple hundred couple thousand a year perhaps um so um the market isn't large so they have to recuperate all the R and D costs somehow and secondly the the professional grade ones uh, from the likes of Deniki uh, Ambient uh, Betso um they they are made really well like bear in mind. As a sound mixer, I hand this this off to the camera department to take care of, and I do not trust the camera department. It survives a camera department, so they are built really well. Um, and uh, uh, one thing as well to keep in mind is that as a an o owner operator, um, wh when I think of how much I can charge for this, typically a rental for a, a smart slate is around seventy five to one hundred US per day. I'll make that up in 10 days. So um, so it, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not that large an investment compared to like even a single a single channel of, of professional wireless. And Courtney? Oh uh, yeah, Mickey covered all the high points there. It does have to be rugged and all of these slates, the professional slates have uh, what's called TCXO, temperature compensated crystal oscillators in them. Uh, so that they lose very, you know, they're very, very accurate uh, from, you know, over a long period of time. 
And especially if you're working outdoors in a variety of different temperature conditions, it has a little oven inside that keeps the temperature of the crystal at a constant temperature so it uh, does not vary in frequency. Uh, plus, they are shock mounted because the camera department will drop them and they can break the crystals. Also, they have to have a pretty good amount of batteries on them because the time code displays have to be very bright to be read, be read care, uh, completely in, in broad sunlight outside. So it has to have enough contrast to be read in direct sunlight. And so when you drop them with a lot of batteries in them, that's a lot of weight hitting the ground and they will bend, break, or shatter. Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to emphasize it because um, Courtney you mentioned it as well. Like I, I sort of said it sort of jokingly earlier about camera department dropping the slate. It's rare that the slate does not get dropped. So like they have to be built really well, like just uh, honestly speaking. Next question. Bobby Rafferty is up from Central Florida this time, and Bobby says, It has been one year since Adobe Firefly AI tool has been released. How have you been using it, and what do you look forward to now that it's in Model 2 beta on the Adobe Firefly website? Sky? Well, again, coming from the old school of hardware, and that was my tool, being able to go onto any portable device, uh, iPad, iPhone... It's, it's kind of magical in that sense, but I'm also recognizing it's building its own community. And there's very much a community uh, theme around these new tools because they're cutting the cord on the way things used to be. One of the specific points is uh, we needed specific iconic um, architecture in our backdrops. And Adobe, because of its license, because they don't want to be sued, they were very aware of, yeah, we can't put that graphic or that building structure in our AI image, but here's a here's a blob of a building that could be similar. So there's the the challenges that Adobe has that I didn't have with Midjourney. Jeffrey. So I really like the, the uh, generative fill, uh, being able to uh, take a look at something and say, hey, you know, this wall, this wall right here needs to be a different color or my shirt needs to be a different color. Uh, I've used that or bringing something in, of course. And then the other thing is the text to vector graphics option, because uh, I can uh, then create some things that, you know, Photoshop has some basic vector graphics, but it, you know, it's nice to actually not have to sit there and actually plot out a vector graphic and just say, hey, make me a leaf, make me an arrow make me something like that and then i can bring it into my uh thumbnails i can bring it into my uh whatever i need it for next question douglas carmichael's up next has anyone ever used thx spatial creator for spatial panning in a stereo music mix how does it compare to dear vr music jason i've only ever used thx tools and and whatever the 3d one is that's native in logic um so I, I looked into it. I don't know why you would master in, in anything that doesn't allow you to look at each individual thing and then um, mix it out to Atmos. And as far as I can tell, Dear VR doesn't do that. So, yeah, no. Nah. Next question. Walter Palmer and Lewis Delaware is getting down to the basics. What's the preference for audio jumper cables? 16 or 22 gauge, stranded or solid? Mickey? Uh, I would typically, um, mo mo most of my cables, both for field work and also um, studio work, are 24, um, uh, 24 gauge cables. I use um, uh, Canary Star Quad or Mo so Canary Star Quad in the field and Mogami Quad in the uh, in studio. And Courtney. Yeah, I would never use 16 gauge because that's just too thick and always stranded cable. Uh, 22 or 24 gauge, uh, because the heavier the cable and the more solid the cable, if you use solid wire, the more it's going to break as you move it around because it, uh, it's either it's going to break or it's going to break loose the solder joints at the other end because the stiffer the cable, the more stress there is on the connection, uh, either soldered or crimped or whatever to connector that it's attached to. And Mickey. Yeah, and I think the last time I've come across a solid core cable specifically for audio was uh, like an installation from the 70s. Next question. Matthew LeCount in Oakland says, would I place a Genlock sync device between the camera and ATEM or does ATEM 2ME order sync frames? 
Mickey? Uh, in terms of where uh, the the uh, gen lock or the, the sync reference should be uh, placed, it should be connected to um, ideally all video devices in the pipeline from the camera to the router to the switcher, every single piece um, uh, ideally would have a sync reference sent to it. Um, you're asking about the ATEM 2ME. There are multiple versions of the ATEM um, 2ME. If you're asking about the current generation of um, Constellation HD or Constellation, um, uh, Constellation HD 2ME, yes, those have frame syn synchronizer, synchronizers in, on the inputs. But if you utilize them, you will have um, uh, each uh, signal's frame, each frame of uh, every input will be buffered until all the inputs have uh, completed a frame so that they come into the switcher in sync. So, uh, and that buffer, of course, causes latency. So typically, um, I would avoid that and uh, use a gen lock reference so that everything is in sync. There's no need to use the frame synchronizers. Courtney? Uh, yeah, Mickey covered it really well. The ATEM 2ME does have a reference input, the newer ones and uh, the newer ones will do frame sync on their own, but if they have a reference input, uh, they will sync them to the reference input. And that would be your best bet because of uh, minimal or zero latency if they're all reference synced. Next question. Comes from Robert Soji in Los Angeles again. In this case, the question is, any lower cost options to MIDI for simple playback of video files? George? I wouldn't say a play be as lower cost, but definitely it's an option there's also vlc but let me just say that when what it depends on what you use it for playback once you start getting into production you might have someone is calling for 30 seconds 20 seconds in playback so it's all about what controls do you need the last thing i will say about midi is it does tie to the atm so you could actually trigger midi directly from your atm in production but again vlc is an option but you're going to run into problems if you have to trigger playbacks on the fly Next question. Alexander Knight in Port Coquitlam is back with this. I do ISO recording with multiple Panasonic Lumic, Lumen, Lumix excuse me, cameras on an ATEM and use time of day time code, the default setting. I'd prefer my time code to start at zero. Any pitfalls to switching to free run? Mickey? Um, yeah, th there shouldn't be any pitfalls of switching to free run, like specifically for your workflow. But um, I just want to point out that your um, recording time code does not necessarily have to be your timeline's uh, time code. Um, if you're recording uh, right into an ATEM Mini, it does generate a DRP file or a DaVinci Resolve project file um, automatically that starts each of those um uh, projects, project timelines at the recording start uh, time code, but that can be easily changed if you go into Resolve, right click on the on the timeline here, go to timelines, go to starting time code, and then you can change the time code at which that specific timeline starts. Uh, so like I say, in an episodic show, uh, you would typically start episode one on one hour, episode two on on two hours, episode three in three hours, and so on. And uh, you, uh, a traditional workflow would involve having some bars and tow and a slate in there, and also a two pop. So it typically, like for this project, we started the timeline at the below fifty nine thirty. That gives us the 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 runtime to be able to have all the prerequisites at the head at the head, while the show itself starts at one hour here on the here on the timeline. Courtney? Um, one gotcha you might run into is if you're shooting a 2398 time code, uh, is that uh, if you switch over to time of day time code, it may go to 30 frames per second, even uh, non uh, a integer based uh, time base, so that the uh, accuracy of the time will be better. But uh, unless you're doing drop frame on the 2398, um, you may not see the times line up if you switch over to uh, time day time because it's not doing 2390. Chris? Alexander, it's 2024. And I can't for the life of me think of a reason why having time could start at zero would ever be a, a, a good idea. I think I, I'm curious to hear why, why, but I, as an editor, I don't ever want to see anything but time of day. It helps you solve so many problems in post-production. 
when you have a reference to like what time of day something was shot? Sky. Second, the vote on time of day uh, from an editor's point of view. Also to be aware that the file naming can be dangerous because I've had multiple cameras somehow spit out the exact same file name. And so when I try to do a relink, it points to another camera and my image doesn't show up the way it showed uh, it was supposed to. So that was just a gotcha. And Mickey. Yeah, I agree with, with Chris, like having time of day. Uh, if you have story producers uh, or even regular producers, directors, ADs taking notes of uh, things that happen on a, uh, on set, they can just look at their watch and reference that time and that will match up with the time code or, th- or at least be uh, close enough for you to be able to search a clip as an editor. Um, the um, And I lost my train of thought. Thank you. Go ahead, Courtney. Here comes that train now. Uh, yes, it's, uh, one one thing I, I did think about uh, a lot of a lot of sound mixers would start the day at zero, uh, regardless of what time it, of the actual time of day is, so that their the time runs continuously across the production day, so they keep everything from that day in order. Because frequently here in Hollywood, we shoot past midnight, and if you're shooting past midnight and you're on time of day, it goes to the next day and it goes back to zero again. So then when you throw it onto a timeline, the stuff that's shot after midnight may end up before the stuff that was shot earlier in the day uh, because the time code goes back to zero. Unless you're taking into account uh, a date in the user bits, uh, it can misorder things if you cross cross, uh, midnight. And sometimes there was some problem with crossing midnight with some editorial programs didn't know how to handle that time code shift in the middle of the tape. Next question. Craig Kadoki is back from Toronto, this time with, can you erase and or format an SSD attached to an iPhone? Go ahead, Jason. Well, you can certainly erase. And um, I thought you could format using the files app, but uh, I just looked in on the most recent version of iOS and no, no, you can't, at least not with the native tools. Jeffrey? Yeah, the files app is you can delete the files, but you, you can't uh, you can't definitely format it. If it, this is something where you can't bring a computer with you, I would highly suggest also bring in an Android phone because Androids can do the formats. And then you just basically pl- unplug it from the uh, phone, plug it into the uh, Android, do the uh, format, and then plug it back in. Make sure you're formatting it in the right uh, format into the phone so the uh, SSD works. Next question. Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada has this one. So he's using a Shure MV7, and he's trying to find out if he can run the XLR cable to a MixPre 3 and the MixPre to an M1 Mac Mini, while at the same time from the MV7, the USB-C to an M2 Mac Mini, so he can record the vocals to both Mac Minis recording in Logic at some time. Mickey? Uh, yeah, you can use both the XLR output and the USB output at the same time. Uh, though I would probably prefer to run the mix breeze USB output into the computer for, for logic uh, because it will be utilizing the um, superior preamps built into the mix pre as opposed to the ones that are in the MV7. Next question. Next question is Robert Soji in Los Angeles. And Robert says, any comments on the Sankin CS3E versus the Sennheiser or Sheps equivalent? Mickey? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say like, yeah, these aren't really equivalents. I think uh, I, I have a bunch of CS3Es and they are, um, I would call them a specialty uh, microphone wherein if you're in a situation with really... Um, un, un, um, really, if you're in a really noisy environment, for example, or uncontrolled environment, um, the CS3E has a very, very tight uh, pick pickup pattern, and is able to um, very efficiently uh, uh, ca- remove off-axis uh, noise, or, or it has very good off-axis rejection. Um, I personally uh, prefer the sound. Uh, prefer the sound of my Sen- Sennheiser mics and my Shep mic- Shep's mics um, a lot more than the CS3E, um, just aesthetically that, of course, that is very um, uh, subjective. Um, but it's really good at that off-axis rejection. Another thing with that, though, the CS3E is also very unforgiving of poor boom placement. So your boom operator 
really has to be on the ball and swing, swinging the pole. Um, just the sentiments are off and it sounds totally different. So I would definitely like, I would avoid using a CS, CS3E um, just like mounted on a stand, for example, for a sit down interview, because just a tiny bit of movement from your subject will, will cause it to sound very colored. Uh, it really has to be right on there. Next question. Next one is from our QR codes again, and this time Chris in San Francisco asks, when are you going to update the Fix podcast or for Spotify and so forth? Alex? Uh, you're on mute. I said that on an anniversary show, too. I got it. I, it's the first time I've had that in a long time. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so... Um, we are putting together a team. Uh, so this is an all volunteer uh, core. Uh, so uh, everything here that you see is done by a volunteer. And uh, when there aren't volunteers to do it, then it doesn't happen. Um, so the reason that there isn't one right now is because we're building up a team. There's three people that uh, um, that will uh, that are that are starting to organize that. We should have it up relatively soon. Mickey. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, if you volunteer, maybe it can get the up there earlier. Yeah. I knew that was coming. Thank you, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> Next there question. Three, by the way, there there are three ways. There are three ways to help to to participate uh, deeply beyond just being a great producer, which is which is appreciated. One is to be on the panel. Number two is to volunteer, and number three is to donate at officehours.global slash donate. These make all, these three things. There's office hours slash panelist office hours dot com or dot office hours dot global slash panelist office hours dot global slash volunteer office hours global dot donate those are the big three so if you if you can do one of those three be great if we can get those links in the chat as well that would be helpful as well all right we're on to the next question bill Bobby Rafferty from Central Florida comes in with this one. I have been using the new motion design tools in Unreal Engine 5.4 beta. Alex said this was for live broadcast graphics. I only see it making renders with tools you would see in CAD 4D. What am I missing? Go ahead, Alex. Uh, we're going to be able to talk more about this in the near future. Nick Justishin is going to be uh, jumping onto the uh, graphics days and panel, and we'll probably be covering Unreal Engine at least once a uh, once a month, um, just given how much is going on over there. So, uh, so stay tuned for that, and we'll get into more of these details very, very soon. Next question. Harshid Trivedi, who's often on the panel from Daytona Beach, Florida, says for international travel, is it okay to travel with perhaps an interface and a mixer in a mixer bag in the main check-in luggage? Or could it potentially damage or leave room for theft? Mickey? Yeah, um, I, I, I've uh, both checked in and also carried, uh, uh, hand-carried um, equipment, including mixers, uh, on international trips. Um, if I am able to carry them in, I'd prefer that just for safety, especially if it's um, if I would not be able to get the job done uh, without said equipment. Um, like this is a one a typical sound bag that we use on for location sound, and uh, I carry enough in here in the cabin for me to be able to start shooting. So I carry my uh, recorder in here, uh, a couple channels of wireless. And uh, the rest of the gear goes in the in the Pelicans in the check luggage. But if ever the check luggage doesn't make it, I can get the show started with this. Courtney. Yeah, what Mickey said, but I would not put a bag unless it's inside of a hard case, uh, a bag set up, uh, you know, your mixer bag that has mixers and wirelesses in it, et cetera. Uh, just loose as uh, checked luggage. Carry it on, it's fine, because you're taking care of it. You can put it under your seat in front of you or in the overhead storage. Uh, you may check with your airline because there are restrictions on carrying lithium-ion batteries in checked luggage. So you may have to carry on the batteries, because uh, I think they only allow those up to a certain uh, amperage level in the uh, passenger carry-on. Uh, and they don't like them uh, in the checked luggage. Uh, because, you know, things can run into them. And if it's in a canvas bag, you know, think of your luggage. If you have your clothes in there, it doesn't matter if a some big, strong case like an, an you know, ATA-rated case gets slammed down on top of your bag. If it's just got your clothes in it. But if it's got sensitive recording equipment, you don't want those, you know, 50-pound cases sliding around in the hole and crashing into your bag. Hasn't it? Yeah, I suspect uh, she is traveling to India. 
they very anal about the security. So I'll put whatever I can into the check-in luggage rather than carry on. Uh, there's quite a, a effort to get through the security with carry-on luggage and support what Courtney says, put it in a hard case in your, in your check-in luggage. And Mickey. Yeah, I just want to add as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the what interface or what what mixer um, uh, Harshid is talking about. But if it in case it's a uh, battery powered equipment, uh, bear in mind that you are not supposed to um, check in uh, lithium uh, based batteries. You're supposed to have lithium based batteries in the cabin, and each uh, uh, battery pack should be a total of a hundred uh, watt hours maximum. And Jeffrey. And if you're flying uh, airlines that you are not sure of, you've never been on before, like Lufthansa or something like that, then you should call them and you should say, hey, I'm going to be bringing this with me. Uh, what do you suggest that I do when I bring this on as carry-on luggage? Next question. Richard Bullman in Defiance, Ohio is up next. I'm both impressed and concerned by the AI song generation tool Suno AI. Will tunes like this, uh, will tools like this be used for ideas or for final creation? Jeffrey. I would say uh, for ideas, a lot of musicians like to create their own music. They like to play their own music. And if they're going to be taking something and going ripping direct from AI, it's not theirs. So that might be uh, problematic there. Uh, for YouTubers, this is uh, great because uh, not only because it's it's background music, but also with the new AI feature, you have to check mark saying that has, something's been AI created in your YouTube videos, that this would be great background music and, and, uh, and you'll be able to put that in there. But there are a lot of times you'll have to worry about a little bit of copyright and you might have to uh, defend where you got your audio from. And Courtney. I think it'll be used for both, uh, for inspiration and for, I mean, look at auto-tune. You know, that was just designed to kind of correct your pitch a little bit. And it's, then it became a whole genre of music with it being misused. So uh, it'll probably be used as an AI as well uh, as, a, as its own genre. And Alex? You're on mute. Sorry, I'm testing something complex before the for the next hour, and it's been a little bit. I'm turning that off so that I don't bleed in. Um, the uh, uh, you know, it's going to be used uh, in final, it, like just the same way people complained about synthesizers and sampling and rap and all these things with all these other bits and pieces. This is going to be another piece of final creation, um, and and so I think that the hard part is is that where bands make money right now is touring. It's hard to tour with AI. So, so it's not going to matter whether you whether you make it with AI or not if you can't perform it. I just saw a show, a great show on Saturday from a band called Wilt with my with my daughter, and um, uh, they're not going to be able to do that with AI. You'd have to actually be able to play on stage. So I think that that's going to be a hard thing. It's like you can make the music, but who will care if uh, you can't take it on tour? Courtney, and just like Bob Dylan could uh, have the voice of Enrico Caruso, you know, what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Well, as we get ready for our second hour, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what's happening this week on Tuesday. It's a to be announced. So you want to stay tuned to our email list where you can get all of the schedule updates. And then on Wednesday, we have ear training. So if you are someone like me who's not astute <laughs> when it comes to sound, this is the episode that you want to be on, the show that you want to be on. And as Alex alluded to before, if you are one of the producers that this is a great opportunity for you to come and join the panel and share some of your experience. And then on Thursday, another to be announced, but you really want to check your email to see who that, who or what we could potentially be speaking about on Thursday. And then on Friday, it's Tenacious Venture Studio. So we will be talking to Carl Christensen. 
Carl, I hope I got that correctly, and engineer Chris Hunter as they join us for a Q&A session and feature about live events. And then on Saturday, that's our marathon Q&A. So if you got your questions stored up during the week, be sure to come in on Friday and answer them. And of course, on Sunday, that's our introspective show where all things life, office hours, production, those are the times, that's the day that you want to bring your questions. And if, again, if you are watching this, you're watching the replay and you want to ask your question at any time, feel free to head over to askofficehours.global as we get ready to just connect with this great panel going into the second hour. And I'm back. (laughs) Welcome to our second hour as we celebrate the fourth anniversary. Four years ago, Alex Lindsay came up with this idea of office hours in the midst of the pandemic. And you know what? Alex is our our, our one of our our, our second hour guests. Alex, I'm going to get some time to just speak with you uh, because we do have so many new people in the community, so many new panelists. And well, welcome, Alex, to the second hour. Yeah, it's good to be the guest <laughs> for, for, for once. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, this this time four years ago, walk us through it, through that moment you where know, you flipped the switch. Yeah, I, so I think that what happened, this happened about two weeks after the closure. So there was about two weeks of figuring things out. And there were a couple driving factors to starting office hours. Um, uh, one of the one, one of the, the major push uh, for it was that I had been doing virtual events for a lot of different companies, Google and Facebook and a lot of other companies for about a decade. And I had done, you know, a couple thousand events and the first couple hundred were not great. <laughs> like, I mean, they weren't bad. They didn't fail, but they weren't very compelling. And we were still figuring out how to do it. And, and there was a lot of challenges and we had to learn how to prep, prep our uh, remote guests. And we had to figure out how to build show flows uh, in for the virtual experience. And I knew that everybody else is going to have the same problem, you know, and what I was hoping to do is, is I really believe in virtual events. And I really felt that if we don't help people move forward, There'll just be a lot of failures. And then when COVID ends, we'll go back to what we were doing before. And so I was really committed to let's make sure that everybody succeeds because and, and, and you know, selfishly, that that affects my business. <laughs> you know, people being successful. The first time we did the first time I got into virtual events, I wouldn't tell anybody anything. You know, once I knew how to do it, you know, we were the company to hire to do big virtual events, you know, a decade before uh, because we had been doing them and I wouldn't share any piece of it. And, and even in our company, people. Uh, there was like three of us that knew all the pieces, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, there was everybody else knew the part that they needed to know so that I could protect that IP. But what I realized is that really undermined the industry. Uh, it, it undermined that we knew a lot about how to do Google Hangouts at the time, but we wouldn't tell anyone. And so lots of people failed. And then they gave up you know, on doing those. Uh, and then the industry, then people went back to what they were doing before. So I was like, well, this time I get to do it. You know, you rarely get to make, uh, go and have it make the mistake twice. I uh, usually get to do it once and then that's, uh, you know, get to come back to it. So COVID gave me the opportunity to come back to that same thought process and do something different, which was let's make sure that as many people as possible know how to do these online events, know how to integrate this, know how to be successful. The other thing that I had is that I didn't really know how to use Zoom. <laughs> so so I, I, you'll see in this little play out, there's a little thing on the bottom of, it's called Patreon. And Patreon, that's because I forgot to change my name because I didn't really think about that back then. And we were doing some, doing some work for Patreon. And, um, you know, because they had to suddenly cancel a whole bunch of, they had to cancel South by Southwest and they had to do an event. And I realized do, getting ready for their event, I have no idea how this platform works. You know, I'd done tons and tons of things with, with, with uh, custom platforms. I had done a ton of things with Hangouts, but I had done like one or two things with Zoom. So I was like, I don't understand how this works. And if, the only way for me to figure this out is just to start doing it every day, do it every day. So in the mixture of, I want to sh- make sure that other people are successful and I need to learn <laughs> how to do this as well. Um, you know, I, I was like, well, you know, we'll see if, if a couple people show up and we'll just start having a conversation. I didn't expect to have anyone else have answers other than me. You know, like I just thought, I'm just going to go up there and start answering the questions. It allows me to run the platform. Um, It allows me to help other people. You know, it was my office hours, right? Um, That that devolved almost immediately. Within the by the end of the first show, you know, 50 people had shown up. 
Um, well, what, so. what was that like, though? Like, so what actually happened for those who have not heard this story before? No one's seen it. No one's seen it. I have it. That's what I, that's why I was having trouble with my audio. I have the first show. Do you want to see the first show? Do you want to see like, oh, yes. Thing? Producers, oh, this is our, the beginning yes. of the Let's first see those hearts in the chat, the thumbs up. Do you want to see it? That, other than a couple people that have the file, I don't think anybody's seen this first show since we did it. So, so, it's so, so here it is. Here it is. Let's see if this works. Um, I don't, I, ho I hope this works. Um, so anyway, so let's see here. So we'll cut to here and this is how it began. Look at the faces. I'm just like, I'm just like <laughs> the uh, I'm on camera uh, stare. I'm trying to figure this out. Like I'm trying to. Oh, oh, I guess you can't hear me, can you? Hold on. Can you hear me? Not. We the hear program, you. We don't hear the video. Correct. Um, there we but go. Uh, because so I, I have a black magic micro that's up here, and then I have, and then that feeds in the the monitor version. There's, there's two things that come out of a black magic micro. There's a uh, HDMI. So this is, and then there's S. Boom, boom. So, so the reason you can't hear me at the beginning is you see, you see this concerned look. It's me trying to figure out how to get the audio to work. <laughs> see, I, at first I thought it wasn't any audio. That's why I was so confused is me trying to figure it out here. So you can see it here. You can see, you see me sitting there. You're literally walking. Out. The first episode like, is you like, literally my, my walking through it. Hanging out. Like, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out like, okay, which way is up here? See, now I'm frustrated. Like, I'm just like, wow, well, ah, I'm in front of a bunch of people and I can't figure out how to get my audio to work. Like, that's what's going through my head. I'm giving you like the little play by play of me trying to figure this out. And I've, you know, um, I've got my little, uh, <laughs> like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, so we'll, I think I don't, you know, so we're now 45 seconds in, I haven't gotten any audio to work. Let's see but if we, was this before Mickey was involved? Yes, this was before Clearly. Mickey was involved, but not very much. <laughs> I think Mickey was in pretty early, but, but I was like, you can see me trying to stay calm, but I'm like, it's not working. I can't figure it out. 30. So somewhere in here, I got it. Now Eduardo I'm, I'm says in the so comments, he's like that like, troubleshooting face. You definitely yeah, yeah, had that just, troubleshooting face. There we go. Everybody in. So now I'm trying to, get, and now it's working. So I'm sitting there looking, looking around, trying to figure out. I'm much more calm now because I figured it out. Um, but I getting on. So you see me kind of answering questions, but there's Phil. Hold on, Phil. A bit know, of a controlled switching um, situation, and I just couldn't find those controls. Yeah, so it's a it's a mixture. So, so in um, the beginning, it was I was you know, probably answering more questions. You, uh, anyway, so here's, um, but we, we kind of, there's, there's Grant. It'll output as many people as you have. You see them as an individual NDI uh, input into the TriCaster, and then the and then also the uh, the screen share, and so Is he in a truck? it just works. It works. This is really his, his, his garage. Does, does his Memo, garage. Memo Live do it? Do that so as well? this is. You can see me asking questions now and realizing, oh, this is oh, going to yeah, be a lot yeah, more fun. Um, oh, there's Oliver um, on the first from, from one. Skype. So you're wondering, oh, we're yeah. using Memo Live. There's yeah, Oliver. First, I, I very can, first can, episode, can, Oliver jumped all on and, and was uh, part of it. Phil. Well, it's going to be interesting. Um, um, what I'm interested in, in that. Within, and you can see. Let's see if I skipped Randall Northcraft. Who I don't remember. Oh, yeah, he's been. He and this was the result of a tweet, right? This was. I just tweeted it out. Tj Tj, will, who will be at uh, NAB with us. Uh, he's at CBC, and he was there. Um, and you have, the, it, interestingly enough, uh, just as a, the very first person to talk was Micah Andrews. And I just thought that was oh. really interesting. Mike, Mike Andrews is no longer oh. with us, but but he he uh, he was the very first person to say something um, in office hours. I, I didn't Dude. notice that until I was and prepping then you can this have file last a night. Web presenter, right? And and what I what I want to point out with that piece, um, and you know, we really miss Mike 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 Andrews. He's, he's a great guy. Absolutely. Um, so, um, sorry. <laughs> So what I wanted to say was how powerful uh, what we just had this morning compared to what the first show had. So this first show was all me, all me, all me, a handful of, we had a couple people jumping in and I was, I was, I was uh, struck by this morning, we had a bunch of people from all over the world and I barely answered anything. We have an incredible host, Liberty. Uh, we have an incredible panel with all these folks technically answering the question. And I feel like that's a huge success. Oh, and, and of course, it looks just a little, 
a little nicer than the first one. I mean, this one is 360p. You know, I zoomed it up. <laughs> you can see how soft it is compared to where we where we started. But it was really, you know, this heavy lift. And every day, it's not, you know, every day I'm trying to hand things off. I'm trying to have other people take take things over um, and, and have other, you know, become more and more redundant within the system. And I think that today was a good example of that. Uh, an incredible set of answers. Um, an incredible conversation that I had only a little bit to do with uh, in the first hour. I answered, you know, I filled in a couple holes here and there, and that's really by design. That's what we've been trying to do over this time. And I just want to uh, also acknowledge the incredible team. This was me fiddling around trying to figure out how to get my audio working day one. And now we have this huge team that is, you know, that makes this happen every single day. You have a tech team in the back end. You have people that are inviting you in. I had a little problem with my audio beforehand. So, JJ pulled me out and we figured it out. And then I came back in and there's an incredible amount of infrastructure um, that, it, that it takes to have this happen. And it's just been a real uh, testament to uh, the dedication of the panelists, the volunteers, everyone, uh, the producers are asking questions, everyone that's been part of it. It's, it's really kind of an amazing, I don't know of another organization like it. I mean, I just don't, I don't know of anything else. And again, I, there's all kinds of things that we have to keep on working on and every organization, once it gets above about 10, becomes complicated. Um, but but I, I will say that it is an incredible, it's become an incredible community um, that, that, I, that I don't know if it's like anything else. And, we, and I just want to say one person that, that has been here a lot that we, we, ha, we don't get to see, isn't, wasn't able to join us today is John Preto. And I just want to call out to John. Hey, John. Yeah, he's on Chris's. Yeah, John, we miss you. His phone. We miss you. Uh, we uh, uh, we we hope we hope to see you back here. Um, but uh, but we 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 miss you. And I just wanted to, John John. I don't think missed one for a th well over a thousand uh, shows. And so and he he hasn't he isn't able to join us today. But we really really appreciate all your contribution, John. So thank you so much. Well, I know that the we've got some the panel with their hands up there's the producers producers we'd love to also see and hear some of your memories and some of the impact um i'm seeing even in the chat that um eduardo was trained um as a td and a switcher and the oh workflow from dennis champion walker um so let's let's continue this this conversation as we reminisce down down memory lane jason Oh man, I, I was there on the first one and I, like just seeing that video um, of Alex just like frowning into the camera and, and like for a second I thought I heard myself in the um, in, in like your play out or something but your headphone wasn't working right it was yeah i know you were bizarre. in there as well you were in that first one as well and, and it was it was uh you know I was kind of skipping through there but but it was it was definitely a uh you know, I was like, I got to figure this out. And so yeah, but and, it was and I perfect. It was like proof weeks of concept. Was definitely chaos. And like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bill. I'm just going to say real quickly, it's like my evolution at NAB. I used to think NAB was about seeing things and I quickly learned that it's not. NAB was about meeting people. And so has office hours been to me. I've learned a ton technically. I've learned. I've grown so much in terms of my ability to handle modern technology. But really, it is these connections with human beings. When I see somebody IRL, when we did something like travel to Las Vegas to John Preto for his rocket launch, and we all got to see each other, it really was like coming home to the town you grew up in in a very real sense. Uh, so many people that I knew and that I was able to give a handshake and a hug to for the first time. And uh, I'm just going to mention really quickly, we noticed that uh, one of our old deeply involved people, Dennis Champion Walker, passed away. Uh, and there's so many people like him and Mike Andrews that we met, were affected by, and their loss really hits us like somebody you grew up with now because of the community that has developed here around this. And I'm just forever grateful for it. Yes, Alexander. Yeah, I started watching, I can't remember the exact date. It was not quite right at the beginning, but I started watching fairly early on and, and it got to the point where I was watching it every day and I didn't want to miss an episode because I, I found that I, you know, I, I embarked on this journey of wanting to learn a lot more about video production and it's re it really kind of just made me up my game and I've learned an incredible amount over the last 
uh, few years. So it's been in, invaluable. The community has been invaluable to me and just learning from everybody here that has so much more experience than I do in that particular area. And I, I continue to treasure that every day. And I do, there was one moment I do remember very, very clearly when I first started to do some major changes to, to, to my entire setup. And I remember holding my wallet and it just melted. It just melted. <laughs> Yes. Nobody hears yeah, the wallet that. melters. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jeffrey. So yeah, I, I didn't start. I wasn't here on the first day, but uh, shortly thereafter, I started uh, joining in and being a part of it. I, it was like there was a Facebook post uh, of a mutual friend that uh, got me on here. And the best part about this, in the last four years, I hate I hate going to class. I hate going to schools. I didn't want to sign up for something and and then just kind of forget to go to the classes and, and, and learn new stuff. But the, the best part about this is there was some constantness. So I could improve on the stuff that I was doing. So I could, uh, so I could learn some new uh, trades and some new things as AI started to grow, uh, working with some of the people here that have been uh, on the forefront of AI, as well as people uh, in other areas. It's just, it's a different way to learn. It's a different way to, uh, it, to, uh, figure things out and being able to jump on and say, hey, can somebody test uh, test this for me? Uh, how does this look? Uh, that way, I'd, when I go to do uh, shows like virtual productions, I can, uh, I can confidently uh, do that and, and get things looking pretty decent from the limitations that we have out there today uh, being so far away. Go ahead, oh, Alex. Sorry, I didn't hear you there. The um, yeah, the uh, uh, I you know I think that's what's interesting is for all of us, for or for many of us, it's just the practice, the practice of doing this every single day. Um, there is something about you know doing it that I mean, you can see <laughs> again if you look back. I've made some improvements uh, to my to my setup. Um, you know, like if just 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 a little. You know, if we look at that, that's where I started. Uh, um, if you're wondering what the benefits are of a panel, uh, being on the panel is you go from this to you know something that looks a little bit a little bit cleaner <laughs> than than, than oh, what I we have. I think Black Limbo is coming back, Alex. Don't don't be so. <laughs> Don't be so like limbo, limbo and yeah, overlit. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I think that there is, you know, there is a comfort that I have with, you know, I'm constantly rebuilding my system and kind of improving it and everything else. And it makes a difference every single day. And what I, what I want to say is that I also, I learn something every day. I mean, I learn about new products. I feel like from being on the panel and having to kind of keep up with these and, and all the great questions that come in from the producers that I'm learning something and I'm forced to look for something or I, I see new products, I see things that are coming out. Um, I'm, I, you know, I learn from the other panelists every day. I learn from folks that are making comments in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the chat every day. So these are all things that, and it's a constant, um, uh, improvement. And, and I think that, I don't know, I don't know where else to find that, <laughs> like, I, you know, and so that's the, uh, and being able to do that every day and having something that, that does that it's been, you know, it's, it's a pattern, you know, for me now. And it's obviously, and, and I don't miss very many of them. And I, but I, and I think that, um, I feel like I'm missing out when I get pretty frustrated. I mean, my at this point, my travel schedule oftentimes is driven by where will I wake up and what kind. Like my my choice of hotels is is there good bandwidth? <laughs> Not necessarily is it near the venue, but am I going to get good bandwidth at at that hotel? Um, uh, and am I going to be able to land in time to be on the show? And so when I miss it, it's always very very uh, you know because there's something major, but I, it's some or something's happened. But but I uh, I'm, I'm I just I, I love the show. And I just want to pull in some of the the wonderful conversation happening from our producers. So Eduardo said, John Predo, he is definitely a mastermind. Um, Craig also echoes that. Good to see John. And Eduardo also mentions that uh, it's it's about the people, the connection and the relationships. And I remember for myself, um, I think it might have been. So if it was March, it was June, around like June 20th, that I got a Facebook message from um, Colin Sandy in out there in DC. And he's like, I think you need to check this out. <laughs> I think you need to get you need to get involved. And I think that's what it was. It's like people saying you, you, you should check this out. There's these people, uh, you know, meeting. And so I was I was in behind the scenes for a very long time, occasionally responding to in the in the just in the community wise. But it was like, oh, my goodness, 
I found my people. That's how I felt because, you know, this marketing techie girl goes back and forth between countries and stuff. And here are people who are pretty much living that same life of it just on the looking at what's next. AI, uh, AWS was definitely one of like one of my favorite. I think it might have been a month before that I said, you know what? This space is going to be like my professional development. So once a week, I will, you know, get on the panel and I'll, even if I just sit there, <laughs> just get to get on the panel. So I'm saying, sharing this story for any of you producers out there who, um, who think that, hey, you know, maybe I should join the panel. Um, that it just takes that one step of like, I'll just come on, even if you don't say anything. And then just by chance, there and, might be a question. <laughs> and I will say that Liber- Liberty shared a couple times and then I, and then it was very quick. Hey, how's it going? What you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. That was, that was a very quick, like, how about you, how about you do some, be a question, you know, man of some questions. And then, and then about a couple, a couple months later, like, how about you host? Uh, like, you've been <laughs> right. Really great right. And it, it, yeah, it's just been, it's just been an amazing time. Courtney. Well, I wasn't there on the uh, day one. I joined maybe a month or two later. Uh, but having been retired for uh, about four years before office hours came in, um, I kind of missed the camaraderie of having worked in television for over 50 years, uh, missed the camaraderie of being on the set. And I saw this as, well, this is a good way to meet some new friends and uh, deal with uh, people in the industry. And and I really missed, I had a bad case of gas, uh, gear acquisition syndrome, which is uh, those of us that are in the industry know that, you know, you see something new and you got to buy it. And since I retired, I didn't have any reason to buy any new gear. But once I came on office hours, it's like, oh, I got to change my setup. I get to buy some new gear. All right. So I got to satisfy my gear acquisition syndrome as well as a a great outlet for uh, all of my lousy jokes. (laughs) Mark. Well, I just want to say thanks to Alex and all the people on the back end and the producers and the panelists, because four years ago when I first started watching this, not the first show, but sometime after that, and then got the courage to join as a panelist, I've come a little bit of a long way and I've learned a lot about radio through you guys. And I've learned a lot about presenting in architecture and engineering. And so the presentations have got better. I can doodle now in the Zoom calls and and uh, it's just been great to be here and, and learn a lot. Chris? I remember the first couple of days, uh, first day I, I was like crawling out of bed cause, to hop on the thing and my wife is like, where are you going? I go, I, 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 I'll explain later. And then by like day two or day three, she goes, are you getting paid for this? I go, honey, just... <laughs> and, and I look back, I look back in hindsight and I've made, you know, lifelong friends, also Mickey. And, um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> and... Um, I wouldn't trade this for the world. CJ. Yeah, by a lot of accounts, I'm the new kid on the block around here. But um, definitely just wanted to thank everybody for welcoming me into the group and giving me something uh, that I can focus on every single day. How do I get better? How can I change one more thing at 1% better every day? I'm always looking for something to improve. So thank you to everybody in here and especially to, to Ryan Rademan and Josh Kaufman, who really helped push me over the edge from being the person who listened to audio only while I was mowing my grass to uh, being a panelist in about three months. That's so awesome. I love these stories, David. Yeah, I got to say uh, that first step onto the panel was uh, transform- transformative in the best. Um, for a long time listener, after hours participant for a bit, uh, but making that taking that first step has paid for itself in spades with friendships and with gig connections, et cetera. And I'm really grateful for that. Hasmuk. Uh, you know, on my 70th birthday, I had a number of folks here in the community send me personalized messages, which was at that time during COVID, I think we were all looking for compassion. We were looking for friends and office hours provide this neural network, digital neural network that allowed us to kind of dance our emotions through that neural network. And it was just awesome. So at the 70th birthday, my daughter made a cake, which I think is legendary cake. 
uh, with a <clears throat> a um, desktop with a monitor and uh, me slumping over the desk, completely exhausted by attending office hours, and a bag of golf clubs lying on the floor. So that kind of epitomized uh, my my involvement with uh, office hours. One of my regrets is not having more people from Africa uh, participate in this office hours because my son said at, at that birthday of mine, he cannot figure out how, how I reinvent myself every time. But when you reinvent yourself, you have others who have been the mentors, the chiselers of what you then start uh, embarking on. So like uh, Courtney, I also bought toys. Before I knew it, I spent a quarter million rands in toys. And my wife was uh, literally uh, more than livid. Uh, But I then uh, was asked to do a medical uh, event. Being a doctor, they turned to me for that. And uh, the team was very gracious to invite the head of the department to a meeting and gave great advice on how he should manage this. And one of the things Alex said in that meeting, but Hashbuk knows enough, he can do this for you. Uh, That wasn't a very pleasant uh, wake-up call. They did turn to me to do the event for them. And I was going to do that all pro bono. Uh, I always say my second name is Gandhi. Um, But then... uh, they, they looked at all the toys I bought and the effort I put in, and they asked me to send a check, an uh, invoice. So I said, really? So yeah, please send us an invoice. I'm happy to say, Alex, that they paid for everything at that first event that I had. We've had now, now eight or nine events since then, and we are expanding the program. So I've had quite a few corporates come into my, our newer offices and they look at our setup and they're just completely blown away. And I've had more than a few people say to me, you're probably the only person who does interactive collaborative production because everybody else does a, a asynchronous webinar and they ha- cannot measure the return on investment on that. So now the medical fraternity is asking me to scale this, and I'm happy to say that instead of uh, every six months, we're going to have a, a production every week with every different specialist that will scale across the continent. And I'm really, really excited. So I'm 73 now. And thanks to office hours, I don't have to figure out what to do for the next seven years because I'm going to be very busy. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Hasmuk, there are, Harshid says, love to you, Dr. Hasmuk. Well said, Hasmuk. Love cooking with Damianti. So, <laughs> so much, so much to share and, here. And I, just, I just want to say that, like what, what Hasmuk just, just shared is was the intention when I started is that people would take what we're, what we're talking about, apply it to what they're doing and extend what we're, you know, and keep on, you know, building something new. And I'm, I'm learning watching what Hosmuk's doing, you know, so the idea is that he's, you know, as he builds those things out, I can figure out, you know, I'm learning like what works and what doesn't work. And I'm keenly, you know, um, you know, paying attention to that uh, because I think all of us, if we keep on pushing that forward, I think that there's a new way of doing much of what we've done in the past uh, using these tools. Paul? Yeah, Hasmuk, you're just a kid. I'll be 80 in December. And I I really learn a lot here. And and my questions aren't academic. They are generally applied to something that I'm faced with in the real world. And I learn a lot, and I'm looking forward to seeing office hours really take off. I think it's poised on the threshold of something really big. And the best part of office hours is all the friends I've made here, all the relationships, all the uh, people that I know now. It's just been a tremendous experience that I expect will continue on. 
Josh? Yeah, I think a lot of us have found office hours because we had a problem to solve. Um, you know, we were working on a project or we're looking for a certain technology to research. And um, that's really, I think, the start the genesis uh, for a lot of us. We come in looking for a problem to solve or something to do. And um, we figure out, you know, how to do things, but also when we meet the community and the different people making different things. And so all the different manifestations, the different shows and things that office hours have done has brought out of all the people that have gotten together to try and solve problems and do things. But it turns into, you know, the OH space, the Belfast method, cooking shows are different trade show things, you know, Tony doing his own show and things. Um, that's, that's really people come in now and they see that the front face of the show, but it really, it's the manifestation of the community, uh, behind it that creates all of these things. So, um, you know, come for the tech, but stay for the community. Alexander. It's really been fascinating to, you know, as a starting out as a spectator to just watch the entire show's production really change uh, gradually, but quite considerably over, over the last four years. And, you know, we've all pushed each other to change our setups and, and, and improve our cameras and lightings and all the stuff that we do. I, I, there's one thing I wanted to share that I thought was really funny before I became a panelist. It, you don't really hear a lot of it now, but I remember in the early days, every single episode, there were so many times like, Alex, I just remember you constantly saying, you're Zoom muted, you're Zoom muted. I think now that we all have hardware mutes, that's kind of gone away. But I just, I just remember that just being like, what is happening? And I had never used Zoom, so I'm like, what is going on here? That's funny, Sky. My sister-in-law runs a hospital, and I said, at the beginning of this adventure in COVID was, who is Dr. Novel? And she says, no, Novel, as in we have no idea what we're, what's going on or how to solve this problem. And Guy Cochran, again, my neighbor of 12 miles away said, oh, you got to get on this Zoom thing. And because my wife as a teacher was also trying to figure out what she's supposed to do with her small children now. And the continued evolution the two mantras that I've I have been embedded in my soul, Alex, are to create a nutrient rich environment. My church is so tired of me telling them that now, but it has created an expectation that what we're seeing here, the ripple effect of um, I, 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 the, the the laboratory that that you've created and that has continued is I, I again coming from Hollywood. I said, you know, content is king, and Alex. You responded back, no, no, no. Community is king. Content is the honey that draws people in. Now, I don't know if I'm telling the seven, you know, the, the, the spice, the secret si spices here, but I, I love that we're reflecting now and watching this giant, you know, what started out as a small ripple from a small little rock just continue to become boulders of change. But that we, again, want to come back to it always being novel it always being original because there, we once we think we have it all figured out i think that's when things will start you know becoming being you know complacent so i appreciate the energy that we have now love the reflection of where we've come but man where we're going woo well we've heard from uh, all the panelists i think it's a great time for us to get into some of these questions bill all right. Our first one comes all the way from Adelaide, Australia, to our dear friend Grant Whitehead, who says, Four years ago, Alex's Zoom on production profoundly changed my life, leading to new partners and work. Kudos to Alex for growing the community to thousands. As I miss today's panel due to these connections, what excites you the most about Office Hours' future? Sky? I think I just, I, I think I shot my comment already. So, next. All right, George. What excites me next? Um, like many of you that went to university, including myself, Officers Hours is like, a, like the never-ending university. I mean, here we are four years in, right? Is it graduation day yet? I don't think any of us would ever graduate because we're going to keep on coming back and learning and expanding. And the good news is we never have to go on a campus to do that. So kudos and uh, cheers to the future. Jason. Mm, I, I totally agree with George. Um, for me, 
the future of office hours is that they're with this group of people and the people that, you know, have yet to discover it. But but really with this group of people, there isn't a line we can't push. There isn't a bar we can't raise. And I love that. I mean, I loved that three years ago, two years ago, and it just continues to be true. Alex? Yeah, I, th- I think that what I'm excited about is just seeing where we, g- number one is where we go next. So we're continuing to, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get to the other end of that. I mean, we're just going to keep on expanding what we're doing. So where do we go next? What is the next, you know, NEB is going to be our biggest coverage of a con- conference. Uh, you can see the the size of the, some of these panels and and, what, and, the, and even on every day, the different panels that come in. Um, and, you know, where, where does that go? Where, what kind of productions that are we able to produce? Um, so those are the things that excite me about office hours. It also excites me to see what people do with it, like Hosmuk and and Grant and 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 many others. Uh, just seeing what people take from here and put into use in the world, uh, we're really you know we see a huge opportunity to impact education, um, not just around this vertical, but around our all verticals. Um, because what we are solving is, in my opinion, the hardest part which is the conversation part. The Q&A and the conversation is what no one does very well or very few people do very well. And, you know, we haven't solved it yet, but we are in this process of solving it. And as we start to apply this, this applies to many, 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 many things um, that, that, and as Hosmuk said, most things are really just a VOD that you're watching. <laughs> you know, you're someone just kind of, uh, you know, uh, running on about something. And this is really the proper use, in my opinion, of a live event is to have conversation. I am really excited to just see even like as uh, teams expand, like you mentioned, NAB and people on the ground. And uh, there are a lot of women that are behind the scenes. It's Women History Month, so you know I had to say something there as well. But a lot of the women that are behind the scenes uh, and just making things happen. So I'm looking to see like who's that? Who are those next people that are going to be involved? How is the community I'm going to be inv- uh, expand as well? And I'm even looking at some of the comments here. I saw it you know, Tony Mobley, long time office hour, um, uh, really like a, a product of what happens when somebody comes in and then they just keep asking and keep asking and asking and, and growing and the community gets behind them. And so he says, congratulations, office hours, happy anniversary. Um, Kyle is asking for a Sky story. So Sky, however you fit that in later on, but just so much to those are some of the things that I'm looking forward to in the in the future. Next question. TJ Asher, another one of our longtime friends here, is from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and is in with this. I see a lot of OG Office Hours members here that I have not seen in a long time. What have a lot of you been up to? I'm hoping you're busy with work if you are not here helping us to learn. Go ahead, Sky. I've learned how to wear scarves. No, Keenan actually uh, called me out <laughs> on that because uh, I apparently came on. Came un- un- no, I've been doing a lot of live production. And ironically, this training has has become a a source of income. And again, because, as you say, the muscle memory of doing things repetitively, I hope I've gotten better. But uh, yes, and many of you I've worked with directly in your hometowns. So it's a live production for me. David. Yeah, I've actually, uh, we swung home on that Friday, the 13th in March, and I've been working remotely since then. One of the things we were doing prior to getting going home was looking to move things into the cloud. We kind of still are. But uh, I was just reviewing some of the products I was looking at. EasyLive.io got bought up by LiveU. We were looking at them in 19, I think it was. Um, on a personal note, uh, that Sunday place that I go to, I'm the chairman of the board there now. So looking to do great things there. I've got some exciting live production things that I'm going to be letting folks know about on the in the Bay Area. Southern Cal in New York and DC uh, towards September. We'll let you know. Awesome. Next question. Joe Andrews in Lebanon, Oregon. What has been the biggest success for office hours as a whole so far? Are there any major individual wins that the panelists would not have had without office hours? CJ. Uh, one of the big successes for me has certainly been uh, being uncomfortable. I feel I find that uh, especially as you go through and you've been doing something for a long time, whether it's in a job or in life, you get complacent. You have a tendency to want to get complacent and get comfortable. Office hours has made me uncomfortable in the best ways and that it makes me want to be better all the time. And it makes me want to keep improving and keep tweaking. Uh, So that's been wonderful. And the second 
big thing for me is it's allowed me to, whether it's in an, a Zoom meeting, a virtual meeting, or an in-person meeting, it's helped me formulate my ideas in a more concise and a more clear manner. And it's also helped me think creatively because I'm always thinking on my feet when it comes to office hours. I find that even when I'm approaching problems that isn't necessarily in a meeting environment, I'm thinking about them in a different way. The brain is a muscle and office hours helps me stretch it out almost every day. Sky? I think, CJ, you and I have to have coffee because I have had coffee with each of these people here in, in, in person. And that's just crazy. That shouldn't have happened, but it has. And the, as you say, the, the, the welcoming, the encouragement, the, the prodding and the poking of you can do better. It's, it's a, it's a safe. Uh, so the, my biggest uh, success will be when I have coffee with CJ. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, being a worker bee and being in radio for many years, I'm never uh, used to being recognized. And uh, after starting office hours, strangely enough, I'd go on the set uh, as a little worker bee in the background, and someone would come up to me and said, hey, I saw this video of you on, on YouTube the other day. <laughs> and so it's one of the first times I've been recognized for this ugly bug. <laughs> That's so true. Co uh, George? So uh, the biggest success for uh, office hours, I would say, is uh, definitely uh, community, obviously. Um, I would say my the, the wins is just being able to stay connected with all the folks that are here on the panel today and definitely on the background, folks of Jeff, Jeff Kitley, uh, Greg Gibson. I don't think I would, would have ever got on AWS and started building out these infrastructures. You know, I, I, a few days ago, I just finished building up my Nimble streamer. And that's that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever, in, you know, try to build out and I'm still able to, when I have an issues, tap into those guys in real time, even if I'm on a show site. So I think uh, it's the community and the wins are every time I accomplish building out whatever, what, what is a AWS instance that requires a lot and being able to accomplish that, I think it's just going back to everything I've learned in office hours and just being able to tap into the resources from here and beyond. David? Yep. Yeah. Uh Guy, uh, Sky, rather, um, Mickey. Uh, I still want to have coffee with Mickey, so I'll get you there. So there you go. <laughs> Alex? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I'm always surprised on a, a near daily basis. I was talking to someone yesterday about something. We were trading texts, and they were like, oh, by the way, uh, it, there was a, it was someone that was a guest on our show in the past. By the way, people keep on coming, telling me that they saw me on the show. And he goes, he goes, it's very interesting how many people are like people in the industry are watching. I think that that's the interesting. So when, when I go to convent conferences and people walk up, because we just have a sense of who's on the panel and the handful of questions and things. And we don't realize how many people are actually watching the show. It's, it's kind of an amazing thing. So I think for me, the win is always when someone walks up and just says, if you're watching this, if you see me at NAB or something else, feel free to walk up. Not while I'm recording. But right afterwards is fine um, uh, to uh, maybe while I'm recording. Anyway, so so the um, uh, but but it's it always feels good. And, and you realize like how important or it feels like it's much more important to me um, because it's it's not just that it's a large it's not a large number. It's the quality of the people. And I think that this organization, you know, in our show and everything else attracts a certain kind of person that I think it really um, is part of that really makes this community special. Hasmuck. Yeah, I think uh, some of the things I learned in office, something called action occurs when possibilities are greater than circumstances. So <clears throat> it, what, what I've uh, learned is to be persistent with what you believe in. So I've been very hard about events that I do that everybody has their cameras on, they look good, and it's an interactive session. And each of the medical events we've had, you can see the skepticism initially, the apprehension, or do I really need to have the camera on? And I, I know Alex said to me, well, they want to pass this exam and this training that you guys are doing is what they need. So that's the... Uh, reason why they would sign T's and C's to say, I will keep my camera on at all times. It's part of the requirement. 
So it's been very hard initially to promote the fact that hybrid events are bad or not so good. Uh, asynchronous events are not uh, uh, measurable. So what I've learned from this experience interaction is the degree of professionalism, but the degree of detail that one needs to apply in terms of attention. Uh, I know Miki has given me a rough time at some stages for being very uh, superficial and then he banged me a couple of times and, and chiseled me into being very attentive to detail. So I think that what I've learned and from office hours and my success in my environment is probably best demonstrated by me calling politicians and telling them how bad they look. And initially, <laughs> and initially they wouldn't speak to me for a couple of days, but now I have developed a reputation where the entire political party says to me, we are the top seven and you got to teach us how to look good and sound good. Man, I think I've arrived when that happened with one of our major entities in South Africa. So, you know, if, if, you, if you believe in something and it's experiential and you evangelize and you don't give up, it, you, you will achieve success. So I think that's really what I learned from office hours. Jason? Oh, boy, is that hard to follow. Um, right. <laughs> um, in, uh, all right. In, in, I've, I've been in broadcasting for quite a while. I, I have a background in it. And um, prior to office hours, I had never used, other than, you know, a really old Yamaha O1V digital mixer. And I, I swear I had a dyslexia about using the X32 that Mickey completely cured. And I'm, I am like that truly like massive, massive win. Now, eventually I'll get the Dante grids right, but like, yeah, true, like big wins for me. And Paul? Yeah, I, I, went, I was looking on a shelf in the other room before the show and I saw that the Plantronics microphone that I used on the first show it was a wireless mic, you know, and the technology on that show and the technology... I'm using now, it's light years ahead. And I'm not a production guy, but I'm a generalist. So the techniques of audio and video and interpersonal communication I've learned here have really helped me communicate at large with uh, people, you know, the people who rent properties from me, people who I communicate with. My communication horizons have expanded so much. I'm really grateful for office hours and what I've learned here. I would say, um, as has been going on in the chat, uh, Harshi just said, build friendships and partnerships. And I, I, for me, like there's doing Matt in the Kitchen with Sky and, and crew and and uh, and literally like, hey, can you go out and help us with this? Like it was exhilarating. Um, but then also just being able to be a part of that. I think that was probably my first like being a part of this global production, like on the ground aspect of things. But then the people who will send messages, like the simplicity of sending a message and saying, hey, thank you for answer, uh, you know, ex adding to my question or thank you for acknowledging like just those little things that you know, when the producers, when that happens, how much that means, because it's like the work that we're doing and the impact that we're having. And I just want to take a moment to just shout out Leo Mind Leo Mindel, um, Brian Shands and, and Tony Mobley and Alex, because at some point in time, you have all provided me with some sort of feedback that when people say in Harshid, I saw your comment. So thank you. The reason I'm able to show up is because of that show up the way that I do is because of that feedback. So uh, that that's the way I look at it is just the communal aspect, beauty bubble, AV, um, just appreciating all of that. So next question. Craig Kadoki coming to us from Toronto. Who built the amazing cake and what did you use? Josh. 
Uh, we had a couple of different designs squirting around. We just used uh, stable, stable diffusion, put in some of the uh, media production, uh, cake, anniversary things, and used a little Adobe generative fill, and there you go. <laughs> next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. And Douglas asks, how can we build on the success of the Belfast method to create more opportunities to learn beyond the daily OH framework? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, we're slowly expanding. You saw a little bit of an expansion. I, I will say that some shows like NAB, uh, su suddenly everything stops. <laughs> NAB and the Eclipse are oh. the two big coverages, and they're two one week apart from each other. And so um, a lot of our energy is going into those at the moment. Uh, as, you, as we get out to the other side of that, you're going to see a lot more experimentation of doing um, more shows uh, and more experiments, more calls to action for specific things. Um, so um, stay tuned for that. But I think that, uh, and we're also, we now have, we're slowly ramping up. You can see me using Mimo in uh, graymatter.show. That'll happen in, in for office hours. I've done it for office hours as well. Um, Vector, uh, vMix. Uh, we're, we're experimenting with lots of different ways of doing this in addition to the hardware that we do. The hardware still produces the highest quality of what we have here, but we're looking at all the different ways of doing it, kind of a Rosetta Stone of how do we do the show? And you'll see us keep on experimenting with that, but also with other frameworks and other formats. So stay tuned. The next year should be pretty interesting. Next question. Keenan Campbell coming in from Nevada in the USA. Four years. Wow. Could we do a week of best of office hours showcasing all the projects and shows that we have created as a community? Alex? We might post that. I, I, I will I will admit that I'm not a very past-oriented person. <laughs> so, so usually uh, the day, within a couple of days after I finish something, I kind of just move on. Uh, and I don't, I don't really like spending a lot of time. I think that putting up some videos of showing that would, would be nice. I think that each year is enough for me to look back and, and um, put together some, you know, show a couple of things. Today we showed this one, maybe we'll show best of next year. Um, so, so that might be the next thing that we, that we do. But I, again, I tend to be, uh, I tend to be kind of formatted on towards the future and looking to take the next, uh, take the next hill. Courtney. Yeah, I think we must have some kind of record in, t in broadcasting because this is kind of broadcasting of 1,400 shows or four years every day without a single repeat. Every without show's a, original. Without a record. That's yeah, we haven't done any records. So it might be a record. I, I don't actually, when you said no repeats, I, I actually don't think that, that I think that we have again. I think we need to get a Guinness book. We should start, we should have I, a Guinness I, book team and start proposing John? it. There's got to be some way to frame it in a way that we've done it more than anyone else in the world. And having our own Guinness uh, uh, record, I think is important. So I, so let's, let's work on that. I, I know John's got that somewhere. Next question. Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas up next. Thank you, Alex and Office Hours. This has been an amazing four years coming in because I could not figure out Zoom with the screen reader to helping guide and host the accessibility hours. Thank you. And thank you, Laura. Alex. Laura is such a great example of just such an amazing asset of someone who just kind of came in and, and was trying to figure a couple things out and now is like really a core member of, of our volunteer group. I mean, the, the way that she's the one that suggested, you know, we don't manage the questions anymore. And she's a quite, you know, and among many other things that Laura does. One thing you know with Laura, she takes it on. It's going to get done. <laughs> like it's going to get, and things are going to move. There's going to be action, um, you know, and, uh, uh, and she said, you know, I think you shouldn't be answering those questions. You shouldn't be managing the questions because you could see the stall of processing that and, uh, and just turned it into an entire team and, and really done an incredible job. And, and, and that is just one small example of what Laura contributes to the, to the, uh, to the show. It's really amazing. Next question. Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. Up next, having Alex say, I hadn't seen that. Thanks for posting that. Confirmed my contribution was, were worthy of office hours. What validated you? David? I don't know about, uh, I never heard him say, I would not seen that, but I heard him say, what the what? <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, <laughs> Alex. Yeah, you can tell you can tell when you hit something that I'm not only have not seen before, but I'm like, whoa, you know, like so so that that's my you know, and uh, but I, I it's one of the things I really enjoy about the show is when viewers are posting things that I haven't seen. It re requires me to know it and, it, and it helps me stay on top of the industry. You know, a lot of times I'm always I'm oftentimes working on stuff where we're not just kind of trying to follow the cutting edge. We're trying to be the edge, you know, the bleed, you know like, in the, and we're trying to do new things. And I have to kind of keep up with all of these things that are happening around us. And the easiest way for me to keep up with it has been to be on this panel with this, with this organization, with uh, people like Vic um, making suggestions and asking questions. 
David? Yeah, and I have a separate favorite bar uh, that I keep running all the time. And I did learn one other good thing is keep that uh, Excel spreadsheet going all year and wait for the end of year spend and just bam, and you get most of the things you ask for. <laughs> it's very, I learned that from MSNBC. <laughs> so thank, thanks to the IT crew there. Next question. Ryan Raderman, Chicago, Illinois. What new things might be what might we be celebrating next year on our fifth anniversary show? Paul? You know, you could say that maybe we if we had a million followers, it'd be great. But I think it would be great if we had a thousand true followers who would show if would show up at NAB, would do anything for this cause that it, it would be amazing if we had a thousand people to uh, that truly contributed to office hours. Alex, you know, I I think that for me it's just I'm I'm actually curious what we will be celebrating in a year because <laughs> it's you know we're constantly responding to it. Of course, we we are trying to uh, greatly expand the number of people viewing the show, uh, mostly because it gives us you know we're now being supported. You know, we're going to NAB. NAB gave us a booth. Zoom is, Zoom is paying for our bandwidth. We really thank thank you for Zoom. That was a big check <laughs> so to make to make that happen. Uh, Sony is lending us cameras. Um, we have uh, you know Live View is lending us a backpack. Electrosonic is is lending us mics. There's a lot of things, a lot of people helping us because we're making a difference in the community. And I think that as we continue to expand the number of people watching, um, uh, expand the expand the show, we'll get more support. And what that allows us to do, of course, is provide more use. You know, we're basically we get to be more useful um, by. Um, being able to continue to do that. And we're really appreciative of the growing number of companies that are kind of working with us to help us um, help other people. Oops, I'm assuming next question. Jason? Oh, Jason. Uh, Alex nailed this one. I would love to see more industry traction because I think that we can pay dividends to to the audiences that can't go to NAB. Next question. OG John Preto from Las Vegas, Nevada. I was on day one, and I just wanted to thank Alex for creating the community. I have created lifelong friendships herein, except for Fenwick. Happy birthday, rocket on office hours. Paul? Yeah, I, I just want to thank uh, John Preto because he came to me one day and he says, Paul, you got to check out this show. You got to get on this show and check it out. And without John, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have heard of this. So thank you, John. Next question. Clive Ludford in Kingston, Jamaica is up next. Alex, how would you advise someone who just had a major failed live event, expectations not met? How have you dealt with total or partial failures at events, and what are your strategies for bouncing back? Mm, Alex? Generally, my strategy for bouncing back is to work a lot harder. <laughs> so, you know, take take inventory of what is, of what happened about, and you're looking for, what you don't want to do is look at anybody outside of yourself um, as far as who was at fault. Look at all the things that you didn't do. Now, you don't have to tell the, talk to the client about that, but but look, you you have to figure out, and, and it means that I didn't, you know, someone didn't show up. Well, I didn't call them three times an hour for, you know, an hour before, two hours before to make sure they were there. You know, like that, those kinds of things. You want to look at what does it take for you to do that? And then, you know, start to, you know, build those strategies. And sometimes that's going to mean a big investment of time and energy and asking lots of questions. Um, use us as a way to figure out what went wrong. Uh, use us as a way to figure out how to, how to make sure that that doesn't happen again. That's what we're here for. Next question. John Fisher in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm a fully remote cloud software engineer who discovered office hours in early 2023 via McBreak. Thank you all for providing a space where I can ask novice, dumb quest, production questions to improve my virtual presence. It has truly helped my career. Alex? And that's why we're here. <laughs> so, so is to answer those questions. You know, I think that one of the things I really love about the show is that you're going to get, um, you know, we can get into some high level questions, but we also have basic questions that we're all trying to piece together. Um, and I think that that is, you know, have, making sure that the forum is open to both of those things, I think is really, really important. Next question. 
Alexander Knight, Port Coquitlam, B.C., here on the panel. Can anyone on the panel relate to the fact that friends and family don't understand why you do various projects, such as office hours or podcasts, that don't generate revenue? Life isn't only about the pursuit of money. How should we justify it? Courtney? Yeah, I had friends and family do ask me that. You're still doing that thing? for four? How much do they pay you? Nothing. It's all volunteer work. They just kind of shake their head. In fact, I just finished doing my taxes, and my tax man has the same question. You know, I used to be able to deduct equipment that I purchased because I have a company that um, uh, does production. But if that company doesn't make any money, I can't deduct it anymore. So maybe we should each get a, a dime so at least we could say we had income. We'll send from you a dollar. This. We'll send you a dollar. Yeah. Send me a dollar so I can deduct all the stuff that I bought for office hours as a loss. I hate those. <laughs> That'd be great. David? I think it's all up to what you value. And that's a George Harrison quote. You know, uh, sometimes the, the community, the connections, and the opportunity will outweigh the, the monetary gain, in my opinion. Paul? Yeah, my family, my friends, the guys I talk to on ham radio, they all go, what, what are you doing? And uh, I hope we can figure out a way to kind of bridge that gap. There's got to be a big dummies guide to office hours or something in the works. Alex. I, I think I feel like, again, it benefits me every day. Like when I'm on shows, the fact that I do something all the time is, is makes me much more comfortable. Uh, you know, it's it basically every meeting you go into, you feel like a pro baseball player playing in the little leagues. <laughs> you know, not because people know more than you do, uh, but because the, their ability to present is much different than what you're than than what you're used to now and what you're around all the time. The environment that we're in. Look at this frame right now. If you look at everybody here, um, you know, in a gallery, it is there is no Zoom that I have ever seen ever. Ever, ever, never, ever have I ever seen a, a, a gallery that looks as good as this one in Zoom right now. You know, like, you know, the, the you know, the, and that's what we've kind of brought up as a group. Um, we, we expect more. And I think that that is something that um, is really uh, powerful. People spend a lot of time on things. They, they study martial arts. They, they learn how to do pottery. They learn how to, you know, this is, you know, for me, this is my boat. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's an, you know, like, and, and I'm working, you know, like I, I, you know, but this is, you know, you, you work on it, you're constantly working on it. And, um, um, but I think that this, you know, I, but everyone spends time on things that they love and we, I love, I don't, you know, I think we're all here because we love it. Um, but I, but I, uh, I love working on this and this is, this is the thing that I like to spend time on. But I, again, everyone spends time on something. Um, and, uh, this is much more productive than many other options. Sky. As a creative, I'm very gooey, and I love all of this 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 community stuff. But technically, yes, I've had to justify this, and so my rationale on my taxes are R and D, research and development, professional development, and uh, marketing. Because again, without this connection, I would not have a bank account to pay for any of this. Because you have you have hired me, and I've hired many of you. That was a good, really great point there, Sky. Um, I think I heard somewhere recently on a podcast where they said um, the role of a visionary is to see it before everyone else sees it. So when you look at it from that vantage point, most people who are watching Office Hours are looking ahead at something, some problem they're trying to solve. So there's that aspect of it that I, I take comfort with. But then also, as Alex always says, is, you know, the best way to convince someone is to show them. And uh, it was a little while ago, a few weeks or months ago, where my daughter showed my parents, she just played Office Hours for them. And they're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> they get it. So by showing people, Mark. So Alex, tell tell everyone that you come here because you want to continually learn. You want to help others, and you want to make new friends because this is what we do here. Yeah, absolutely. Next question, Douglas Carmichael. How can we make people with disabilities and neurodivergence welcome in office hours? Jason. Douglas, I think you were the perfect example of this. I, I think you are you are probably the largest all time question contributing producer of all time. So to to, to that end, I, I'm going to answer your question with a question: um, How many more you got? And uh, next question. Brendan Buttram in Indianapolis, Indiana, has our last one today. Not a question, just a thank you. 
to everyone for fostering a community where something like After Hours can exist. Alex, I want to give you the last word, <laughs> the last word before we wrap up. You know, I just, I, all I want to do is thank everybody. I mean, we thank everybody at the end of every show, um, but it, it really is heartfelt, is that this is not something, this is the, I mean, this is not something that can be done by someone. This is not a YouTuber that is doing a show. You know, this is not a, uh, you know, one person or one thing doing the show. I am, uh, I become less and less needed every day and that's by design. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I'm only uh, hosting about half the shows and today I spoke very little bit. We, we had a lot of panelists and, and that's the goal. The goal is, is to keep on having the, the community take over um, and, and then I get to enjoy it as, you know, and be part of it as well. And, and I think that I just want to thank everybody that's taken it on because there's a lot of folks that are not on the show that we haven't been able to talk about. We can't have a long list of absolutely everyone because it's so many and it includes all the producers asking the questions. This is a truly a show that all of us get together every day, seven days a week and build a show together. The people watching are part of the show, the people that are, that are cutting the show, the people who are designing the show, the people who are on the show, everyone is coming together and we're building our show. And I just don't know of another place to do that. Um, and I really just appreciate everyone being willing to take uh, part in a totally insane idea that just feels like it just keeps getting better and better. So I just really appreciate everybody's contribution and can't wait to do it for another, you know, decade or two. Well, to our producers, thank you so much for your questions, the comment commentary, the bonding um, to our panelists for which with no, we wouldn't have anyone to answer questions and the OGs definitely for coming back and to spend time with us today. We hope to see you more. And of course, our production team without which this would not be possible. And before I get to the the rest of what we normally close, I do want to take we do we all collectively want to take this moment to remember Dennis Champion Walker, who for a lot of this infrastructure, our ability to be here it was because of him. So if we could just all take a moment and then I'll continue. This is what community is all about. And as we go to the Talak Traversal, that 70,000 miles, this is how far we've traveled, 113,000 kilometers, that's 500, I'm sorry, that, yeah, 554 million bananas for scale. And if you want to learn about the rest of what's happening on Office Hours, you can head over to officehours.global and we'll see you in After Hours to celebrate. Bye. Thanks for all the bananas. This is what AI thinks bananas for scale looks like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chris, hold Finn. Hold Fredo back up and let's grab another screenshot. Mickey, get your camera on. Bananas as scale. <laughs> Somebody grab a screenshot when Fredo's on cam. <laughs> you muted. I got it. I'll send it to you. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Great show. Good seeing everyone. Yeah. Very Great awesome. seeing everyone. <laughs> Good to see you, David. Hopefully yeah, you get to come every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I know. I know. It's, <laughs> it's hard. Tough. Hard time. Mm -mm. The evening show. When we do the when we start the evening show, you, we're gonna, I'm gonna twist your arm. Okay. Pretty hard. Wait. Okay. What? Right. <laughs> right after NAB. Awesome. Oh, sounds like Great a plan. show. Well, thank you. Oh my. See you now. Call for, <laughs> like all friends.